Hi everyone, this is Mason Christensen, Archivist of the Dearborn Historical Museum, and for this week's video I'm going to talk about alcohol, specifically how it impacted the early history of the city of Dearborn and what was available at many different decades in the city's history. We're also going to take this up through Prohibition, uh, look at really how it impacted some early 20th century politics as well. Dearborn was first settled by Europeans in 1786, and fairly quickly you had a healthy population of people living along the Rouge River, growing their own crops, growing fruit, growing grain and the like, and this leads to a surplus in agricultural production. At the time, farmers living in the Dearborn area don't really have that much of a market. It's not profitable for them to sell their grain out east, uh, sell any excess fruit out east. Basically, they could sell it to Detroit, and if Detroit doesn't want it, there isn't a lot else that they can do. So what happens in areas like Detroit or other western markets is that you have a lot of alcohol production facilities that are set up very early in the late 1700s, and that was the case in Dearborn. Around 1796, an American named Oliver Wiswell, who came from out east was one of the, the first uh, merchants to come to the area after the Detroit area became part of the U.S. in 96. Uh, he, he started a distillery roughly at the uh, current location of Michigan Avenue and uh, the Southfield Expressway today. Um, it only lasted for a few years. Uh, from what I can tell, it was probably a fairly small, fairly poor distillery but it was obviously taking advantage of the ample agricultural production along the Rouge River. And to make matters worse about this distillery, where it was given the high amount of alcohol production in the Detroit area at the time, which a lot of uh, army officials complained about, it was very likely catering upon Native Americans because at the time in the late 1700s, early 1800s, Dearborn was pretty much the frontier at that point. It's a convenient location because it's still connected to Detroit via the Rouge River and via some early roads, but at the same time, it's reachable by Native Americans around 1800. And so it's very likely this distillery that's set up is very likely selling uh, whiskey, maybe brandy, to uh, Native Americans in the central part of what is now Michigan. So from research I've done, I've looked into papers at the Burton Historical Collection in Detroit of some distilleries set up by Americans in that city, and many of them seem to uh, import a fair amount of rye from out east and produce rye whiskey, which was very popular at the time. It's got a bit of a spicy flavor, and in the early 1800s, well, actually well through much of the 1800s, whiskey was of a fairly poor quality, and the spice and rye would often kind of come out flavor-wise, so rye whiskey was very popular, and that's very likely something that they were producing at this distillery. Uh, unfortunately, this place closes by 1805, and you don't really have a lot on the uh, alcohol front going on in Dearborn until the village of Dearborn is established in 1833. Around when Dearborn was established as a village, you start having a large number of taverns being established along Michigan Avenue, Ann Arbor Trail, and a few other major pioneer routes, because these are really catering to people heading west, just traveling across Michigan in general. And these taverns like Ted Ike Tavern, uh, Thompson's Tavern and the like, they're often places where you can spend the night, they're serving food, but they're also gonna be serving alcohol. And especially many of the taverns further west, they're probably gonna be making some of their alcohol on site, uh, perhaps using fruit that's grown at the establishment to make ciders. You're also probably gonna be brewing a little bit of beer at these places. You know, the ones at Dearborn are probably doing some of that, but at the same time, they're close enough to Detroit where more established breweries and distilleries that are being set up can potentially have their products shipped to these taverns. Something I want to know beverage-wise is that cider was especially popular in early 1800s America. And in Michigan, with all the ample fruit production growing on, even in the Detroit area, it is likely that cider was quite heavily consumed at many of the early taverns being set up in the, this area. 
But at the same time, you also have beer production going on. And when you talk about early 1800s, it's largely going to be, you know, English styles, just because there's not a lot of Germans here yet. When you get into the later 1800s, especially 1840s and onwards, with the Germans here, you're going to start shifting more to lager beer styles. Um, keep in mind, too, in the 1800s, Dearborn does not have a very large population. So the total number of spots where you can even go drinking anyways is not very large. It starts changing a bit as the population increases in the late 19th century. So starting in the late 19th century into the early 20th century, you're only going to have maybe a couple of bars in what is now East Dearborn. Basically, you're going to have the Schaefer Tavern, which is at the corner of Michigan and Schaefer, opened in the mid-1800s. That's very popular with travelers at Michigan Avenue. You're also going to have one or two bars kind of around Dix Avenue near Woodmere Cemetery. In that area, you have a certain amount of uh, sub subdivision development going on fairly early starting around the late 1880s, early 1890s. You know, you also have the village of Woodmere that pops up right by the cemetery. So there's enough of a population base that a certain number of bars pop up in that area. But you have far more within what is now West Dearborn. Yeah, most of the time in the late 1800s, early 1900s, you're gonna have on average around four to five different bars at different times within that area. Remember, the population's not very big, so that's why it's only four or five different bars. But you're going to have ones like uh, Fred Papke. You know, we had a saloon at the southeast corner of uh, Michigan Avenue and Monroe Street. That burns down, so he opens a new one at the northwest corner and calls it a sample room. But you also have bars within the Wagner Hotel, also at Monroe in Michigan. You're going to have a bar at the Cant Hotel over at Mason Street. Across the street from that, at Michigan and Mason, you're also going to have a bar over at uh, the Maurer House Hotel, which was open around 1900. And you're going to have one or two other bars as well at any given time. So not a huge number. Fortunately, due to a fair amount of photos, we have an idea of what bars in Dearborn in the late 1800s and early 1900s served. For example, at the Schaefer Tavern in Michigan and Schaefer, we know they advertised beer from the West Side Brewery, which is in what is now Corktown. You know, they were known for a fairly popular uh, hop flavored lager beer at that place called Mundus. Uh, over at uh, the Papke House at Michigan and Monroe, they advertised beer from uh, Eckhart and Becker, which is a brewery over in the, uh, or in the Eastern Market area. Uh, a little ways down the street at Michigan and Mason, the Maurer House there, a photo there that we, uh, shows that they advertised rye whiskey, which was still very popular in the late 1800s, early 1900s, because its flavor was frankly hard to mess with. You could throw food coloring and the like, you're still going to taste a nice spicy rye there, because it's, you know, it's a time when people like to mess with whiskey, unfortunately. Uh, they're also advertising a beer from Gambrinus Brewery, which is in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh, basically, to me, that, that advertisement is a sign that most of the bars in the Dearborn area are still getting beer from all over the Midwest. This myth of local beer, it, the truth be told, bars all over the Detroit area are getting beer from not just Detroit. They're getting it, you know, Budweiser, even in like by 1910 is pretty much selling nationally. So bars in the Detroit area are going to be able to get Budweiser. They're going to get beer from Milwaukee, you know, Schlitz and the like. Um, they're going to get beer from Chicago. And so it's kind of telling that the small Dearborn bar is advertising some beer from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, personally. So Dearborn, along with the rest of Wayne County, went prohibitionist in May 1918. But that didn't really fully stop the flow of booze in the community. Especially on the east side, Dearborn's big population growth spurt happened in the 1920s. And with that, booze came with it. Uh, you have, especially in the Dix Avenue area close to the Rouge plant, as that area expands, there's a number of illegal establishments that pop up in that area. Uh, quite a few uh, speakeasies along Salina Street in the Dix Avenue area. You know, you also have some in you know Northeast Dearborn as well. 
But the South End area along Dix and Salina, that is really the epicenter of illegal drinking in the Dearborn area. And you have getting into the 20s and into the early 30s, a fair amount of raids that are taken to really go after this booze. Uh, the city of Fordson police is very active in trying to stem this flow, but the booze just keeps falling into the city. I mean, we are here in Dearborn very close to some of the biggest entry points for booze from Canada. Uh, you would have had booze brought up right up the Rouge River, right into the city of Dearborn. But at the same time, you also would have had a lot of booze coming in. The E-Course that probably is driven right up Schaefer Road into the middle of the city. So Dearborn was completely awash with brewing. And it was just nonstop when the people were finding evidence of alcohol establishments. But at the same time, you also had gambling establishments, prostitution places, uh, just all sorts of illegal activity going on with it. And even in 1933, when prohibition starts to end, a lot of this is going on. There's still a fair amount of illegal spots for drinking in the city. And you have, by 1941, you have both the chief of police, Carl Brooks, and the inspector of the police, uh, Charles Slammer, who were actually indicted for corruption for really abetting these places. And just common sense tells you this is probably going on for quite a while because, you know, it's just a constant news story of supposed raids going on. And there's just, there's so many news stories in early Dearborn history of alcohol busts. It's not quite happening like this in other cities. There's, there's so much evidence of, you know, alcohol flowing just in the newspapers. There's complaints. And, you know, all of this is kind of an origin of the idea of that's sprouted by Mayor Hubbard later on, this idea of keep Dearborn clean. The origin of that is basically he's talking about all this vice going on, ranging from drinking to gambling and the like. And he's really, you know, he's promoting an end to this sort of corruption as mayor. So at that point, you know, when you talk about the indictment of all these people, in many respects, this is an end of an era. You go from sort of a wild west in the South End, and suddenly, you know, with, with changes with all the indictments, with a new charter that changes how the city is governed, this is arguably a different moment in Dearborn history. With that, I just wanted to conclude this video and thank people who've listened so far for this. I actually studied alcohol history for my master's thesis, wrote about saloons in the South, and so this has rather, been rather fun to research, but thanks for listening.